Hey friends, Shan here. I am so excited to get to share this conversation with y'all this week as we um, move into our focus of Shiva, the destroyer this week. And I'll be talking in a moment with Max Felker Cantor, one of our members and um, a professor at Ball State. We'll talk about his credentials in the podcast and the interview. Um, but we are in this conversation talking about what it actually means to defund the police and what would the world be like if we really burned it down, if we really tore down the systems of oppression that our country has been founded on and, and started over. Um, so this is a really big conversation. I think as we move to the end of June and further away from the recent protests, I echo the sentiments of many of my peers in the fear that the momentum of the movement is starting to wane because it's not in our face as much. Um, and so I want to I want to recommend to us as yogis, in particular, what I assume is mainly white yogis watching this, who are the ones carrying a great amount of privilege, especially if you are heteronormative, cisgender, uh, able-bodied, Christian, um, you know any of those things where you hold a great amount of privilege. I think as yogis with those titles of privilege, we owe more than anyone else. Uh, the practices of yoga to be revolutionary and to be practices that ultimately offer towards everyone's highest good. So, you know, we, we can no longer blindly espouse things like love and light if we don't include everybody in that. And, and you know, sometimes the, the cultivation of love and light is radical and painful and hard. Um, and I want to shoulder that myself as a cisgender, heteronormative, super able-bodied white woman uh, to use this practice if I'm going to be as a, a poverty, a yogi who chooses the world, then I have to choose this practice to help me become more and more awake and aware and enlightened so that we might all loka samasta sukhino bhavantu, may all beings be happy, healthy, and free emphasis on the all and then in particular you know the marginalized groups because the other groups have a lot more of that um so so as we have this conversation i wanted to give some action items to tack on to the conversation for us as yogis and ways that we can keep the momentum going of using our yoga as a means of radical change both internally and externally self-care as a means of communal care so the first thing that we bring up several times in the conversation coming up is burn it down and this idea of shiva as a destroyer and um, so what i want to challenge us all with is challenge your preconceived notions especially is we're in the topic of yoga you know this is a this is an art and science given to us by brown people that white people have co-opted and appropriated and so I, I would challenge you and I'm deeply challenging myself to con consistently look into my assumptions my preconceived notions and and just the things I've assumed as the gospel to really dive in and learn the roots of this and commit my life if I choose to be a yogi for that long um, to knowing the roots of what I'm really studying and not just accepting the consumer capitalist white washed version of it. So burn down your preconceived notions about yoga, really invest in it beyond the asana. Uh, dismantles, dismantle the systems that encourage your privilege and discourage others' privilege. So one thing that Max and I talked about offline um, in this, interview is that you know in order for us to write the system or to create more equitable systems it is going to mean that those of us who hold the greatest amount of privilege are going to have to let a lot go or at least some go um so we've got to get comfortable with that and you know that means giving up resources that means giving up money that means giving up time now there's a paradigm shift too. Capitalism teaches us that there's not enough for everybody. And so while yes, we will have to give stuff up, it doesn't mean that you're going to be empty. It means that you're gonna share, you're gonna share. And you know, as a married person, I can tell you that while that process, Peter and I hate, well, I don't like sharing drinks with him. Let's just, let's just get that, or food. I don't like sharing food. 
but there's something really blissful when I can learn to surrender and yield to someone else's good. So it's not like this, it doesn't have to be this painted picture of negative. It can be like, what a gift to be able to share and to level the playing field of privilege and equity. Uh, so the first thing is burn it down. The second thing is get uncomfortable. So you know, part of that sharing process of Peter drinking out of my LaCroix and me seething with rage is the discomfort of allowing somebody to have something that I wanted or thought I laid claim to. Um, but in particular, we can use these practices of yoga to sort of simulate what the rest of the world is going to need to be for us, which is to get uncomfortable. So you know, use your meditation practice. If you, med if you meditate, you know it's uncomfortable. Uh, use your asana practice. If you're working through postures that are challenging for you, you know, use those things. Your pranayama, if you're working kumbhaka or retention or extending the lengths of your breath, you know that all of those things are uncomfortable. Use that as a little research lab to get more uncomfortable as you, you know, experience the world. Um, get uncomfortable with your buying habits, you know, ditching things like Amazon where they have an unequal, you know, working privilege practices and, um, in business model, you know, it's going to be hard because it is so convenient to, to buy that thing off Amazon instead of go to the small shop down the street where they may have to order it. You may have to wait two weeks, but can you consider getting uncomfortable in that way to serve the higher good? Um, you know, juxtapose this with also look into what it means to be blissful. And this isn't the consumer, you know, like face mask, although, you know, I know a lot, a lot of love people, a lot of people that I love, love a good face mask, but it goes beyond this self-care we've been sold. Um, I went to this panel a couple of years ago called wellness beyond whiteness. You know, we are sold wellness. But what is deep level wellness? What does it mean to reside within yourself and be truly blissful? That in itself is a revolutionary act. As Audre Lorde had quoted, you know, self-care is a, as an act of political warfare. And she's not talking about a bath bomb, you know, as a black lesbian. She was talking about me being myself, fully myself. That is a revolution. Um, so juxtapose getting uncomfortable with really residing in your bliss and really residing as who you are, that in itself breaks the paradigm and changes the algorithm, if you will. Uh, so, you know, check that out. And then um, get uncomfortable with self-care being communal care, that we're not just doing this so we feel great, but so we can show up fully for other people and we can go to protests and we can give our money and we can give our time and we can commit not just this moment, but our lives to equity, to all beings, all beings being happy, healthy, and free. And finally, uh, something I'd encourage us all to look at as yogis is maybe shifting from sankalpa, which is the intention. You know, intention is a really nice idea. Um, but right now I think what we need more of is action. So maybe swapping out, even yoga teachers, swapping out sankalpa for vrata. Vrata is a vow. And even as I say that, it's a bit appropriative to say that because vrata means in a spiritual way or a pious way. Um, but if you believe that all beings deserve love, light, happiness, health, and freedom, then creating vows in your practice and in your daily life and setting up daily practices of calling your government agencies or learning about who you're going to be voting for or helping advocate for certain um, uh, constituent uh, uh, candidates in your, you know, area, you know, any of that can actually become a spiritual practice. And it starts with your vrata, your vow, not just your intent, but what are you vowing to do? Not just today, but forever. Are you reading, you know, a certain amount of books written by authors of color or, um, you know, authors who are different from you in any regard? Um, you know, those are just starting points, but the vrata, the vow, is the thing that I want us to get really curious about. Not just the intention, but what are we going to do about it? What is, as the vrata definition is, uh, Sanskrit word vow, resolve, devotion, and refers to pious observances such as fasting and pilgrimage. So you know, those are, that is the more like 
actual definition of that, but how can we turn that into political justice and how we show up in the world every day? Um, another definition here, a vow undertaken for self purification and spiritual benefit. So that circles back to everything else, getting uncomfortable, that's tapasya. Um, burning it down, that's also tapas. So how can we create disciplined action set on by a vow to daily practice bringing the world into more equity and in doing so, you know, bringing ourselves into equity and union. So those are some things to consider as you move into this conversation with Max and as you join us this week for this uh, theme of destruction of Shiva in a means to build something better, something new from the ashes. Thanks for listening and enjoy the conversation. All right, everyone, welcome to Practice Indies podcast this week. I have the esteemed honor to have Max Felker Cantor. I've actually never said your last name out loud. Is that correct? It is, yeah. <laughs> Max Felker Cantor has been a longtime member, um, you know, not to play favorites, but there are a few people that when they walk in the yoga room or I see them on Zoom, I have just, I just light up. And Max, you are one of those people. You've always been such a joy to teach and to practice with. So it's so cool to get to have this conversation with you um, in general because of who you are, but also because of what you have to share. So I'll kick this off by saying this week we're going to be studying Shiva. And um, I want to be fully transparent as a white Jewish girl from Alabama that the context and concept of Shiva is much larger than one week of study. You know, there is Shaivism in Hinduism, which is an entire sect of Hinduism devoted to Shiva. So uh, by no means is this a podcast on the authority of Shiva, but what I would love to give our students and any yogis that are watching this is just a, like a sliver of something to uh, try to embody this concept into their lives. And I think in particular, what we're going to talk about today, it's, it's incredibly relevant. So um Shiva is the destroyer. He is one of the three primary gods in Hinduism, and his role is primarily to destroy. And I think in the West, we struggle with the idea of destruction, you know, and I think of holidays that are popular here. They're all about renewal, rebirth, celebration. Um, you know, Easter is full of baby bunnies and chicks and uh, and we don't really love to talk about destruction, and, um, and it's such an important concept, and especially at this moment in time where we have, you know, national chance of burn it down, I think, um, I think it's important to look at this idea of Shiva and the idea of destruction, because what comes from destruction is rebirth. Um, so that's about what I'll say in terms of Shiva, and, and this is what I hope leads into your topic of expertise. So can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and also uh, your writing? Yes, um, well, thank you for that introduction and the opening. Um, I am Max Felker Cantor. I um, am a professor at Ball State University in the History Department and affiliated with the African American Studies Program as well. Um, my teaching um, is in U.S. history, African American history, um, urban history, race and inequality, but most centrally on policing and mass incarceration um, is sort of some of my kind of broad teaching areas. Um, my research focuses more directly on urban history, but also the history of policing and the history of anti-police abuse movements in the United States, but specifically in Los Angeles. Um, and so I study the LAPD, anti-police abuse organizations in Los Angeles, largely all, largely in the post-World War II period from the roughly the 1950s to the, through the 1990s. And so I, um, I think what we're gonna talk a little bit more about today, and I should have had my prop, is that I have a book called Policing Los Angeles that started over a decade ago. Um, it came out about a year and a half ago, and it's on the development of the Los Angeles Police Department, anti-police abuse movements, and politics in Los Angeles between the 1965 Watts Uprising, which was in response to a moment of police abuse, and bookended then on the other side with the 1992 Los Angeles Rebellion um, after the acquittal of the officers 
who um, were on trial for beating Rodney King the year before. And so it tracks that and the relationship between those things over time. I feel insignificant even attempting this conversation, but wow. Um, I guess just hearing that, what parallels are you seeing from 1965 and uh, what, what parallels are you seeing from that time to our current period? Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of like really interesting question in a lot of ways. It's, I mean, it's partially the interesting question is that the reason I say that is because like I'm a historian, you look to the past, but obviously you don't always expect the thing you study to be like so central um, to your kind of present moment. I mean, obviously as a historian, I think it's all relevant mm -hmm. to our present, but um, the parallels, I mean, the thing that I've been saying a lot to, to people is that many of us who study this, the present isn't surprising. Um, and I say that in part because if you look, especially from the perspective of communities of color and other marginalized or communities who have been the subjects of heavy policing, the, the relationship with the police hasn't actually changed that much over time. The police have long been this kind of central force that, re in, that in, my, in my analysis, hold up, protect property, protect capital, and up also uphold a kind of racist hierarchical order. And that's their kind of role in society. And that continues to sh come out today. So it was like that in, in, in 1965, let alone you know, the 19th century. But then also we see that today and you see that kind of what people are talking about today. But it's also that you see these kind of daily kind of ex the daily experience of many people with the police leads to these explosions, right? It's, it's not that like, just because George Floyd was, his murder was caught on video camera by a police department that, oh, everything all of a sudden erupted it, in 1965 or 1992, it wasn't just all of a sudden, is that you had people building organizations, building movements, um, trying to, you know, push for a better world in the in the years prior. And so it, it, that's what then leads in these kind of in, these, these particular moments builds on all of that. And so I think we see that parallel as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a white person, as someone who, you know, of, of all groups, I hold a great deal of privilege in all the intersections of my experience in the world and my identities. I am recognizing that this has been, this has always been happening as long as we've probably had police, um, just because we've had racial disparities in this country since, since jump. Um, and so I think for a lot of white people, it's probably waking up to this isn't new. This is, this is the state of affairs and we're just, mm -hmm. we're just becoming aware of it. Um, and, and that obviously is devastating to me that I've been asleep um, but also now we get to do something about it as a collective, you know, I, I think um, if we can, if we can truly step into allyship, we can help turn the wheel and change and change and make change. So, you know, I'm hearing a lot of recently defund the police, burn it down. I like burn it down. It just, just feels good. Um, I love a good matchbox. Uh, but what does what does defund the police actually mean? And if we were to Shiva style destroy it all, in your opinion, what should rise from that? Right. So I mean, there's a lot there. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, you know, and I think just to the first part of your kind of talking about like a lot of white. You know, that's one thing we see different now. There, there's been a lot of news accounts like oh, there's a lot of white people out at these protests and all of that. Um, and I think that's important. And it's like, you know, as I think the thing that we always have to remember is like the problem of racism in the country is a problem of white supremacy and a problem that like a lot of white people need to deal with, right? And I say this also self-consciously as a white scholar, right? Um, so it is that. It's, it's, you know, it's really important for people to start to shift perspectives because I think there are so many people who grow up um, you know, and I didn't mention this at the start, but like, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the Jewish kid who grew up in Salt Lake City, right? Um, and, you know, it's like, 
I didn't have the same experiences that I write about and have learned about with the police as other, you know, and it's like, it, it's really trying to get people to say like, so many of us, especially white people have an assumption that the police are here for public safety and all these sorts of other things. And if you shift your perspective, you know, to other groups, it doesn't look like that. So that's one piece um, that I think some people are grappling with. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, defunding the police, I think the easiest way to get into this is to think about what I, what activists, especially in Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives, um, call divest and then invest. So what we mean by that is you die, you divest money from things like prisons, policing, um, criminal justice, where there's an overwhelming amount of, of resources that go to that, like taxpayer dollars, but you invest those things then in other things that help keep communities safe, whether that's, you know, health service, just like health care, mental health, jobs, job training, education, schools, right? You, so you, you divest from things like policing, which in some cities take up almost half, half the city's like budgets in some cases, right? Just to the police. And you invest it in something else that you think, you know, in communities can help people be um, and maintain safety, right? Um, and it doesn't, so that's the kind of initial one way to think about it. It's not just like get rid of that money, it's put it somewhere else. Um, and so it's, you know, and it's astonishing, you know, a lot of people are like, wow, I didn't realize how much money the police got, right? In these kind of, um, in, in a lot of these cities. And so it's, to, and so like for Indianapolis, it's not the police, but like the city council like two years ago said, we'll build a 600, $700 million new jail, essentially, what they call a justice complex, right? While we're gonna close public schools. Right. And so it's like, where do we in, where are we putting our money? Right. And so that's the kind of same thing with the police. Do you, do we invest more in the police to do things or do you, in, or do you divest from that and invest elsewhere? Um, so that's part of that. That's like one way to think about it. Um, and then the piece about like, what does defunding then look like is, and what is like, if you were to burn it all down, um, <laughs> you know, to be like, very clear in like my politics on this, like I am in the kind of a word that a lot of people might have heard going around right now or like police and prison abolitionists, right? Are people who want to see a world in which prisons and policing is no longer necessary, right? And is no longer a thing. So like building that world. And so, and I am in that camp. Um, and what that essentially means is the thing that, you know, that scares a lot of people Oh um, man, I just got so excited. I haven't heard of that. And I'm like, ooh, I'm, I want to go in there. <laughs> so, so like, yeah, so it's like these kind of, these, and it's been around for a while, but like, you know, the people who, you, who I'm sure you, like Angela Davis is this like longtime prison abolitionist, right? And so she's like one of the examples um, that's been working on this for a long time, but, and policing. And the goal there is also the way I approach it is it's not a recognition excuse me, it's a recognition that like, if you say defund the police, we're not gonna just turn around tomorrow and have no police, mm -hmm. right? Is that what you are doing as an abolitionist project is moving in a direction that changes along the way, lead you to a world in which you've invested and created a society within which you don't lock people in cages. Mm -hmm. And that you don't need that, that you find other ways to deal with harms that happen in communities, that you deal with other, find other ways to ensure that those, that, you know, safety is ensured in communities that doesn't look like a prison or look like policing as we know it. Um, and that's, that's, it's a long-term project. But, and the reason why we say defunding the police is a step in that direction is because it's a reform, what abolitionists would call a non-reformist reform, which means it's a change that doesn't actually give more money or more power or authority to the police. It says actually this moves us in a direction that eventually we want to move to this other world of abolition, right? And so, um, and so what you build out of that, right, was the other part of your question, is that eventually the goal is it's a different society, right? And how you think of it, it's that you, in the, 
in the sense of like you invest in all these other things that our society in, a, in the United States, because it's based on racism and capitalism, has decided that we don't think we need, right? Like real investment in, you know, like universal health care, um, you know, in particular like full employment and jobs for people. Um, capitalism is, is predicated on inequality. I know people don't like to talk about this, but um, but it's built on that. And so if we, we wanna move to a world where we don't have those things, and that's where you get this kind of rebirth of something that looks, looks very different. Um, and obviously I'm a historian, so I can't tell you what that looks like exactly, but the goal is what things do you do if you take that money away from the police and put it into some other ways of developing safety, community, um, so that people um, can live, you know, better lives. Um, that's a long answer to <laughs> what you asked, but. Um, so good. Like, and you answered all of it, which I'm like really impressed at your memory recall right now. Um, it's, uh, it's a perfect answer, or at least what I was not knowing that I was looking for. Um, there's so much that is interesting to me there. It's like where you, I've been urban gardening quite a bit in the quarantine. And uh, something I've learned is like when you, you know, as a, as a new gardener to prune a plant feels very scary because you're like, but I've got that one flower. <laughs> you get so pumped about it. But most plants, what's that? And then the bunnies eat it. And then the bunnies eat it. And then yeah. you have hate for bunnies, which is a dark thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you cut the, if you cut that bud off and you direct energy somewhere else, the plant explodes. Mm -hmm. And it, and it becomes so much healthier and it becomes, so it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing I've been thinking about is like sometimes to create more abundance and, you know, betterness or whatever that means, you've got to edit, you've got to cut things that will feel painful, that will be scary, but ultimately it will benefit, it will benefit everybody. Um, yeah. And I think this concept of Shiva in particular is, imp I, I, I think it's empowering if we embrace destruction, knowing that it's not destruction for destruction's sake. It's not Heath Ledger in the Batman movie when he's like, I just want to burn it down. Mm -hmm. It's to burn it down in order to create a better, more equitable society. And, um, and if you can't get behind that, there's a lot you have to unpack. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so sure. yeah, I think, I think that's super brilliant and exactly what I was hoping. Yeah, it's like, again, it's, it's, I've been trying to say this, but it's like, it's a process, right? It takes time. It's like people think, you know, the same thing, like you, I'm sure you guys are talking about in yoga classes this week, right? It's like, you're building things up over time. That's why we come back and practice and practice, right? Um, and the same thing, like in terms of these kind of, these politics, right? It's like, it's part of this kind of long-term process of building something. And because of a lot of things going on, which, you know, we didn't talk like COVID and, and these kind of this moment of protest, there's an opportunity to really rebuild the world right now, I think. And that's what I think we're seeing from some people, so. Yeah, thank you um, for your, your honesty and your, um, and your thoughts and your time. I guess my last question would just be like, is there, is there something you wish people as a historian or as a teacher, is there something you wish people knew more about or would, and maybe I'm speaking specifically to white people, um, would invest more of their energy into learning about or understanding? Is there anything in that regard that would help this destruction to rebirth process in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, obviously as a historian, I would say, I think that like people like learning some of this history of whether it's around mass incarceration around policing and all that, like these things were all built, right, historically. Like they're not just like inevitable, they're all built. And so it's like, so as a historian, my point is like that if you learn the history, right, you can learn the choice that you th think, you can think deeply about the choices people have made, why they made them um, as a way to re really see, because I think we get into our present and we're like, oh, this is the way things are. Um, but what history often shows us, right, is that nothing's inevitable and people make choices within particular contexts 
that lead us to where we've where we've got where we've come right and so if you learn some of the history on policing and it's you know deeply kind of racist past and present um, that that can help you kind of really interrogate well how do we get here why is this happening I think that's a good place to start um, you know and then of course the other things that are going around right now are a lot of books that are about um, anti-racism how to be an ally right all those things so those things are good things to also like interrogate and I think for you know a lot of people who are coming to this for the first time it's like is to really be op just kind of be open because a lot of the stuff's in uncomfortable for a lot of people to be like oh I've never thought of myself as being you know and that's kind of the point right it's like you're going to be uncomfortable with this if you haven't really thought about it um, and so that's like you know just to be open to recognizing these other perspectives is kind of part of it as well um, and obviously I'm always in favor of people reading more history. But. Is there, uh, so what's the title of your book? It's called Policing Los Angeles, Race, Resistance, and the Rise of the LAPD. So that would be a great book to read. Uh, <laughs> what would, is there like a history favorite that a book that you'd suggest? Well, I mean, the, the one that I think like a lot of people may, may be familiar with, right, is Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. That's kind of a very popular, like widely accessible book that's not quite as academic, um, but talks about how mass incarceration, policing, all of that is kind of an updated form of Jim Crow. Um, so that's like a, a usually a really kind of accessible, open one. Um, there is obviously like Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist um, is kind of a, is a, is a useful um, book. Um, getting at that. There's, I mean, there's tons of other historical works, but, you know, for people just getting into it, I think those are like at least two, you know, approachable texts that, you know, can help you start to think about some of these things. Awesome. I'll put this one in the show notes too, but uh, one of my favorites is Blessed Unre Unrest. It is written by a white dude, but he's an ecologist. And so it talks about the intersectionality of uh, socioeconomic, political, environmental, uh, mm -hmm inequity and how they all go together. And uh, I think as a white person, it was the first time I read the detailed account of Emmett Till's murder. Mm -hmm. And I had nightmares, still do, about that for not to scare anyone, but to say like, you have to, as white people, we have to face this and it is uncomfortable and, and it has to be uncomfortable. And I think that also is sort of the Shiva energy of destruction. It's like, we want to turn away. We want it to feel good. We want I've had a lot of people ask me like, how are you doing during this time? And I've been brutally honest and people are so uncomfortable with me saying like, I'm not okay. I'm angry. I'm, you know, I have every emotion right now. And I think that's also something that I, I hope to teach on this week. Uh, we're doing Nacho Jarasana, which is just a horrible pose. Um, and it's super uncomfortable. Like if you're, if you're comfortable in it, then you were born in a back bend. It's just really painful, but I think we have to recognize that that pain and that discomfort is part and parcel of the growth if we're really committed to it. And um, nothing in nature goes through change easily. It's always a bit cataclysmic. So um, I thank you so much for your insight, for your honesty, for you being, for you being a yogi and for, uh, you know, since we've been in the garage to, to the, the double decker just thank you yeah. thank well, you for being well, well thank you very much and thank you for for having me and chatting so great thanks max go buy his book he's the best <laughs>